<laughs> okay, so hello, fantasy fellowshippers. I'm Max, and with me here is Richard Swan, author of Empire of the Wolf series, of which Justice of Kings, the first book, exploded onto our shelves this year. A dark and gritty medieval style world that will definitely appeal to fans of books like The Covenant of Steel and The Witcher series. Dark and mildly horrifying magic litters this murder mystery meets grimdark political fantasy. A compelling first instalment in a new series that I'm sure I speak for all who have read it, that we are all eagerly awaiting book two. So welcome, Richard, and thank you so much for joining us, despite the slight time difference uh, in Australia. <laughs> yes, no, it's, it's thank you so much. That's a lovely introduction. It's uh, it's only just gone 8 p.m. here, so uh, not too antisocial, but uh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> we'll try and not keep you from your dinner too long. But uh, why, don't we, <laughs> why don't we just start off with just... Um, like rewind the clock a bit before Justice of Kings uh, got published. What what were you doing, and what actually got you putting those words down on the paper? Specifically for the Justice of Kings, I was um I was I, was, I remember it quite well because I was sat at my desk. I was associated at a law firm, and I was um I was sat at my desk, and uh, I was just kind of fleshing out this idea. That I, a little while before, I had this idea of kind of fantasy lawyers and the kind of the the <laughs> as I would have done and the. The, the very kind of nascent concept was um, sort of like a legal, like a legal courtroom drama, but in a fantasy setting. And uh, the, the idea I had was it was league. It was called legomancy. And what it was, was the idea that uh, the lawyers would use like the magic of words to like put arguments across and things like that. And I, I realized quite quickly that um, it wouldn't the mechanics of that would be very difficult to kind of get on down onto the page for various reasons which i won't go into but um the, the kernel of the idea was there and i was you know i was um I was at my desk and i was must have been a quiet day which is quite rare for me um when i was a lawyer and uh i started just kind of drawing out the threads of this uh this sort of the reading about the holy roman empire and, and you know the roman empire generally and the sort of late antiquity roman empire and i'm sort of fleshing out this kind of germanic type empire with a sort of two-headed wolf device and I'd, I'd read Robert Harris's Imperium probably a few years before, so that was, and I, I think I'd, maybe I just read Dictator actually as well, which is a third in that series. So, and there's a few kind of things kind of percolating around, and um, it, I re it really just started, as I say, with kind of fleshing out that empire on the page, and it's, it's kind of um, the people who live within it, their kind of their mannerisms, and um, I, I looked at the sort of the cultural iceberg, and I, I was like picking out bits and pieces like that, like the food that they would eat and um you know the national dances and holidays and things like this and i kind of fleshed it all out from there really so but for me i um you know up until that point i was i was writing you know books all the time um so i was just turning them out so for me when i started the justice I mean, it was called empress justice um emperor's justice then is in draft and um you know at the time it was just just another book you know i was just like i'll just write another one you know and this time it's gonna be fantasy so uh, <laughs> it wasn't like a kind of sort of cleverly choir inspirational you know, lightning bolt it was like oh, okay I'll write a fantasy novel now and uh, we'll see where that one there uh, that one takes me that's fair um so in this world you've made and all the characters that you created who is your favorite and one of our members wants to know why is it uh Dubai and Bressinger <laughs> yeah. um I it's a difficult one I'm you know, I think each character sort of brings something to the table, and um, you know, obviously von Bolt himself is this kind of it's larger than life kind of you know great man of history type type character, um, mm. and I drew a lot of inspiration from you know, Cicero, the Roman consul, for him, um, and then you know Helena is the kind of the lens through which we view you know von Bolt, um, and so she's much more mercurial, and I think. Um, Helena is a fascinating character. I think, you know, if you look at um, her kind of history, she's had this kind of horrible upbringing as a kind of, you know, orphan on the streets of Moldau. And then, you know, time has gone on. She's kind of been taken on by Von Volt and she's been taught these languages and, and, you know, manners and all the rest of it. So, and she's in a really interesting place because I think, um, you know, Von Volt gave her a kind of a life of wealth and, and privilege. But at the same time, you know, she's relatively young. She's sort of 19. And I, it's, um, 
I think when you look at people who have had difficult upbringings, um, you know, or abuse or, you know, difficult circumstances or, you know, whatever it is, uh, you, what you often find is emotional development actually gets, um, you know, left behind at some, you know, certain levels. And um, I think when you look at sort of Helena and you examine her character and the things that she's been through, she's a very, she's very torn on a lot of things. Um, you know, so she's sort of very grateful to Von Volt and she sees she has a very complex relationship with him. Um, and she, he is kind of her sort of stability, her rock in, in every aspect of her life. And so I think if you sort of, you know, if you read the book quite closely, you'll notice, you know, Von, Von Volt is kind of out of sorts. Helena is out of sorts as well and, and vice versa. So. I think Helena was a really interesting character to sort of examine from, from my perspective and so and, and and view von Volt through Helena's sort of much more grounded lens um mm. so she'll always probably be you know the core of the book for me even though it's technically about von Volt um but Bressinger is Bressinger is just he's the foil he's the you know he's the he's not sort of comic relief per se but he's a because he has quite a lot of ba an emotional baggage he's got a fairly horrific um you know past himself and he was a veteran mm. and a soldier and all the rest of it but He's 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 the kind of when you're sort of drawing up these characters, you can't have everybody just be kind of surly and traumatized. You know, you need to have a, a bit of a foil somewhere. And so Bressinger yeah. kind of filled that role. You know, he was the mm. the philandering, you know, kind of Lothario, you know, kind of you know, drinking, fighting kind of. So he's a very cool character, and he's an easy character to like because he fulfills that role. Um, so oh, you know, I, I do like, you know, and. Um, Another sort of more minor character I really enjoyed writing was Sir Radomir, who um, he has a bit more of a, a sort of meteor role in in, um, in book two. But uh, yeah, it's a difficult one. I think you know they all bring something to the table. But um, you know, I absolutely see why a lot of people um, you know they do like Bressinger. And as I say, I think he's an easy character to like. I think he's a very cool guy. So, so uh, just going back to like Helena, and so th the entire story is kind of told as the memoir of the assistant mm. of the kind of central character of the story. Was, yeah. was it always your intention to kind of tell us in this slightly unique narrative style? Um, or had you originally planned would be almost like set in the present mm. day rather than like as a memoir type thing? Oh, I see. Yeah, I see what you mean. I, um, so what, so yeah, the answer is yes. I, I'm a, I'm a real sucker and not everybody likes this. Um, you know, people like different things, but I love dramatic irony um, and I love uh, foreshadowing the, you know, my, some of my favorite literary devices. And so I like it, you know, just as, because you know Helena survived, you know Helena survives the whole trilogy, right? So you have to find other ways of injecting sort of tension and drama into the, you don't, you don't know who else survives, right? So there's you know, mm. one easy way of doing it. But um, I, I love foreshadowing. And so some people won't like that. You know, they like they think it kind of removes attention from the narrative and that's fine. For some people it does. Um, but I love saying things like because one of the things I wanted to explore with the, the trilogy, the Empire of the Wolf trilogy generally was, you know, a lot of the time you think, um, you know, you'll be watching a TV program or a film or something and you think, why are they doing that? That's obviously so stupid, you know, blah, 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 because you're sort of viewing it as a a watcher in that case or a you know, reader and you're aware of the tropes of storytelling and how kind of how stories unfold and so you think but oftentimes if you look at history or you just look at your own personal experiences often you'll make decisions or you, you'll do things in the sort of in the spur of moments or in the moment generally which don't make a huge amount of sense or they aren't logical but um and they can have sort of you know different ramifications depending on what decision you make and one thing i wanted to explore in the justice of kings is is to say well you know sometimes people <laughs> when they kind of examine it because you know you know the empire collapses i say in the first sentence of the book right it's like you know the end of the empire of the wolf um and so you know that's happening and so it's kind of like a how does it happen rather than a why or if and when i was looking at that i was thinking you know helena is because she's old and telling the narrative she's able to say well you know this we were at the center of these kind of huge earth changing or you know civilization changing events but of course it doesn't feel like that at the time and so I think at some point in, in the Justice of the Kings, Von Bolt says, you know, the, the Empire, there's like, we have a half a dozen of these rebellions every year. You know, this is nothing, you know, mm -hmm. this is just another one. And it sort of ex goes some way to explaining why they kind of delay and prevaricate and they don't kind of address matters as perhaps, you know, with as great alacrity as they should do. Um, and so I, I liked the idea. And, and of course, the great complacency as well. So, you know, you think about um, one of the other themes I wanted to explore was things like, you know, we look at um, in the modern world and we see 
a lot of political upheaval, especially in you know in stable Western democracies, mm. which well, should which should be stable Western democracies. Um, and and what happens is, of course, people get very complacent with the permanence of the state. The idea that the state is a is an entity that's greater than the sum of its parts, and in some ways it is, and in many ways it isn't. Um, you know, a state is just sort of a collection of many millions of people, individual people, mm. and ultimately you have individual people making the decisions which affect. The direction which the nation which the nation goes and so you know i wanted to kind of explore the, the idea that um you know there's this great complacency as well especially with von Vols. and he's like well you know don't you don't worry about it this is you know this is the empire of the wolf you know this is, it's not going to collapse overnight and of course you know that ends up you know happening one way or the other so there was a lot of um when i was exploring the kind of the, the narrative framing device i wanted helena to have survived it and be kind of recounting her memories. I think it's an interesting device to use. It also enabled me to do that kind of that foreshadowing and, and that dramatic irony. And also, the, if you're very eagle-eyed as well, you'll notice that Helena uses um, an anachronistic references as well. So she'll say things like, um, uh, oh, it was like, you know, a, a cannonball or something, or like a, a barrel of black powder blowing up, which doesn't heavily feature in the Empire of the Wolf. But of course, she's an old woman, so she's only 20 in the book. So assuming she's like 70 or 80 telling the story, the, the technology has moved on. So we have these kind of like anachronistic references. Where well, was you know, this little quirk I did, which I thought was very fun. But, uh, you know, so, but uh, yeah, so it feels for those reasons, really. It was just to kind of indulge my my love of those devices, really. So... Yeah, you, you mentioned weaponry there, but like as well as the weapons in this book, we also have quite a lot of quite eerie magic. Yes. And so the all the justices um, have these necromancy powers. And was this something that you had like originally planned? Um, or as you were writing, did you suddenly realize you needed something to drive certain points or certain parts of the murder investigation? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I was um, when I was approaching it, um, I thought uh, when I was thinking about the magic system and how I was going to approach it, I was thinking what law, what magical powers would a lawyer or an investigator want to have? Um, and so, you know, I thought, well, the emperor's voice, which is, you know, the ability to sort of compel you to tell me the truth is you know, to extract a confession from you, obviously, I want that straight away. Mm. Um, but um, so necromancy is not they don't all have necromancy, actually. So um, necromancy is is only a couple it's it's the rarest of so in the in the law in the in world law everybody has to at least try and learn necromancy but only a very few justices mm -hmm. actually get the hang of it so von Boltz is a is one of the practitioners but there aren't many mm -hmm. um but i thought you know obviously <laughs> you could just sort of collar a, a corpse and be like who murdered you and they'd be like oh is that dude over there then you know, <laughs> case closed right so, yeah. um you know so that was uh again it was when i was approaching it, i was thinking what um what magical powers would like a police officer want or like a lawyer want like what would these and so and once i you know realized the ability to sort of question the dead would obviously be a helpful one um it was then like well and then it kind of just went from there and i was thinking well maybe the magic in the world actually is derived from the afterlife that's where all magic comes from and so mm. and then the yeah the afterlife is not actually afterlife it's sort of like a just a separate plane of existence um inhabited by these kind of horrifying creatures so um so that was kind of the way i <laughs> kind of developed it um it, as i say it was just a thinking in my head logically because in the book there are there are lots more magical powers it's just the magistratum they kind of they divested the church of the magic and they were like you're not having that anymore we're having it now as part of a sort of wider secularization of the empire and then they're like right we're just going to give this to our kind of judicial branch and they keep all of the others under lock and key and so there's this whole kind of wealth of magic under the kind of the masters in the master's vaults under the magistratum kind of headquarters mm -hmm. um which they don't use you know because it's too dangerous or it's you know too esoteric or it's been forgotten or whatever so you know there's that whole thing going on as well and um, yeah, so you mentioned about the potential alternate plane of existence, this death mm. realm. So we do see some hints of that in Justice of Kings when Von Vald, like taps into the necromancy. And yeah. these eerie, terrifying like visions. And we get a real like big hint at a potential villain um, going forward. And mm. so will this alternate like 
plane of existence be explored more in Tyranny of Faith, the next book, or is yeah, it still going to yeah. be very grounded in the current conflicts? So, so both of those things actually. Um, <laughs> so, Tyranny of Faith um, is definitely an expansion of all of the, you know, the theme. So we could sort of go to Sover itself and spend about half the book in Sover, and then we go further south to the frontier. Um, but I, for very cool but very spoilery reasons, which I won't tell you about. Um, it becomes very necessary to um, examine the afterlife more and, and in quite an urgent way. Um, and so I, the difficulty I have, and, and this is a, a big preference of mine as a reader, is a lot of the time when I'm reading a book or like I'm watching a movie and, um, and uh, you know, you'll hear some kind of throwaway, throwaway reference. And that, the example I like to give is, a, I think, the original reference to the Clone Wars in um, A New Hope which of course you know by then was just literally one line of dialogue and now we have the prequels and i happen to love the prequels but a lot of people don't so that's you know that's absolutely fine um <laughs> but, but so the, you know kind of has something like the scene the necromancy scene to which you're referring in justice of kings which is like a it's a frightening scene um mm -hmm. and it's quite you know it's quite opaque we don't know what's going on because we're looking at it through the eyes of helena who doesn't know what's going on um and i wanted to make it a very frightening and, and a sort of very high kind of high cost in terms of you know von, 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 it frightens on bolt and von bolt doesn't get frightened by anything so you know it's that kind of high barrier to entry it's one of my favorite scenes in the book and um and there's always that kind of risk i think in any form of storytelling of over explaining things and kind of um, leaning too much into something and um, and kind of ruining it a little bit, you know, and, and I was so wary of that when I was approaching the afterlife because it, you know, it make it forms a huge part of the second book and even more in the third book, even more, you know, it's, you know, we actually spend about a third of the book in the afterlife than book three. So it's um, it does become a huge theme and a huge factor. And, um, you know, we, we examine it a lot more, but I still wanted to keep it um, relatively unknowable because mm -hmm. it you know these are these are a late medieval society you know they they don't have the technology or the house to kind of examine this or interrogate this in any logical way and so I, I wanted to make sure that it was magical it's not physics it's you know these are unknowable you know creatures and and mm -hmm. for so many years and centuries the neiman church has kind of created a taxonomy of these kind of angels and demons and and, and codified them all and von volt's like well you can call them that if you like but you know i don't know who this guy is this kind of horrible and demon creature he looks pretty frightening but he's not a kind of religious demon in the sense of the the church might say he's just a, another creature and so you know we do kind of get a bit more of that um for sure and it was finding that balance i, f I find actually quite quite difficult but i think people will you know i think people will like it so speaking on those um like demonic creatures and all and the aspect of religion so towards the beginning of the book um one of the very early storylines for the first like act is revolves around kind of worshiping like a pagan uh, religion yes. of the old gods and mm -hmm. a few of our members found it like quite reminiscent to some aspects of things like the witcher so were there yes. any stories or works like the witcher or any particular myths that were kind of an inspiration for that kind of aspect of uh, your kind of deities or yeah, sure, yeah. I think well, so the biggest influence on the afterlife side of things was um the Wayne Barlow's um, artwork on on um, on hell um so he he did um a book uh, an art book years ago called Barlow's Inferno which retails for like thousands of pounds now on eBay it's extremely rare um but uh, relatively recently he did um they did a reprint um of all of his hell artwork and he, he actually wrote a couple of novels about it as well which i haven't read but i'm aware of them um and uh it's brilliant if you ever get a chance to look up any of wayne barlow's kind of hell artwork it's fantastic and um so so and i stumbled across that years ago and so it's always been a kind of that's always been the biggest driver of inspiration for me in terms of you know the angels and demons and that kind of side of things um when i was approaching um the aesthetic and the kind of the feel of Empire of the Wolf, um, the Wild Hunt, which is Wild Hunt, which is a third Witcher game, was a huge inspiration. Um, that kind of um, that kind of Slavic, you know, sort of Teutonic um, that feel. And my my wife has um, sort of Lithuanian heritage on her mum mother's side is, is all Lithuanian, so 
it was interesting to kind of well, what's the word I'm trying to sort of cross reference the the stuff in the witch gear, which is obviously Polish, but um to the kind of Baltic states. And so when I was approaching um creating the Empire of the Wolf, I wanted to have them a kind of a, a weird analog of the Roman Empire of late antiquity. Um the Holy Roman Empire in, in terms of its actual structure. Um, but in all, so the Sovans are kind of like Germans if they were Roman, or Romans if they were German rather. Um, but then I wanted to kind of um, round out the idea, the different ethnicities um, and the idea that this is a kind of a melting pot of cultures. I referenced the loss of Slavic names and identities. And so a lot of the time as well, you'll notice, well, people from Slavic countries will notice, um, that the names aren't necessarily from the same. So you'll have like maybe like a Croatian name and a Serbian surname, for example, or um, you know, a Germanic name with a Serbian or a Croatian or a Czech, Czechoslovakian surname. And that's very deliberate because I wanted to sort of show that we have a sort of, it's not a homogenous culture of, you know, sort of Germanic or you know, Anglo-Saxon ethnic kind of people. It's, a, it's this kind of huge melting pot as the kind of the Soviet Empire has just tsunami waved over everybody yeah. else. But I made them kind of um, it was kind of Roman or kind of, you know, so the Achaemenid Persian Empire was kind of, you know, they would kind of move into an area and then they'd say, OK, you keep all of your, you know, you keep all of your gods and you know, keep whatever. But now you pay us taxes and then you just get on with your lives. And um, and so on. But it was, the Romans were kind of more like, no, actually, these 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 Greek gods look very attractive, actually. They're, they're <laughs> as Mars rather than. And so I wanted the Sovans to be like, no. And, and one of the great pieces of tension in the, in the novel uh, in the novel and one of the things that kind of rounds out a piece of world building is that tension between kind of existing kind of cultures and the way the Sovans sort of co-opt it so they're like you know well and one of the as you as you reference in the first two chapters von Volt's like well why don't you just you know use the book of law and from the Neiman Creed you know it's, it's all the same it's the same we've just changed the names it's, we've just rebranded it um and she's obviously very unhappy about that for for obvious reasons so in terms of um uh, the the wild hunt um i definitely it was a huge inspiration for me and and you know Geralt of rivia as well you know it's the idea of a kind of itinerant professional kind of roaming the countryside like mm. solving disputes or whatever with a few magical powers he yeah, absolutely is you know absolutely was an inspiration but um not so much on the magical side um mm. that was that was more like the feel of the world and the kind of the grittiness that I wanted to kind of capture was, was definitely um, a big one for sure. Okay. Um, so you've, you've said before, I think in other interviews, that for quite a while um, it was normal for you to kind of almost try and write a, a book a year from like your early teens yes. to the end of university. Yeah, so have, you ever, right. have you ever like revisited any of those earlier works? Were there any, any hints of like Justice of Kings in those or was it mainly focused, your previous works, the Art of War books yeah. role? like space operas. So it was all, yeah, yeah. old space operas before Justice of Kings or? It was, yeah, it was. It was, um, so I always, you know, I've always considered myself a science fiction writer and, um, you know, I started writing sci-fi when I was about 12 and uh, I wrote loads, you know, loads and loads and loads of it. Um, Justice of Kings, I think, was like a 19th novel I've written and, um, you know, now I've written two or three more since then. So, you know, it's, uh, but Justice Kings was my first fancy novel. But um, so, so the answer is technically no, but thematically, absolutely. And when I was, um, you mentioned my Art of War trilogy, and that was a, a series I wrote, um, I was in my mid 20s, I think it was about 2015. As I was writing that. And one of the key influences that has kind of really influenced my writing um, is, uh, especially since the global war on terror, Kind of really kicked off in earnest. I remember the, you know, I remember the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan, and obviously 9/11 when I was, I was in my very young teens then. But I remember it well. And um, you know, as sort of time went on, and I was reading a lot of Ian Banks, and he examines a lot of the similar themes in his culture series. Um, it's this idea of what what happens when you have a um, a liberal. I mean, the Soviet Empire is, to be clear, like a it's an empire of conquest, and it's killed a whole bunch of people. So it's it's not supposed to be. They're not the, supposed to be the good guys by any stretch of the imagination, mm -hmm. but it's this idea of well, not just because they're you know they've killed tens of thousands of people doesn't mean that the system of common law is a bad thing. It's a a, a good thing that's come out of a bad you know origin, yeah. and so I wanted to get a bit more kind of real politique about things, um, and so you know it's all very grey, but 
one of the things I kind of examined in all of my fiction is this, what do we do as kind of liberal Western democracies when we are kind of faced with a threat that's completely anathema to our way of life? And, and what I mean by that is we have a system of evidence-based um, legal procedure. You know, you, you can't just detain somebody and torture them to give you confessions and imprisoning them. Um, that's for very obvious reasons against the law. Um, and so, you know, we at least have a system of rights, we have a system of human rights, we have a judicial code, we have a you know, separate um, judicial branch and all the rest of it, separation of powers. These are all very important things. And when I was writing my um, Art of War trilogy, I was kind of really into the, the getting into the guts of um, jurisprudence and legal ethics in, in terms of well, what happened, what do you do, what do you do? if you have a society or a right, an alien race or whoever who just doesn't follow those rules and doesn't give a shit about them, you know, to be perfectly honest. Um, and I think, you know, you look at the Western, you know, the powers during the global war on terror and they resorted to things like extraordinary rendition and you know, waterboarding and, and literal torture um, and abduction and all these kind of highly legal activities. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the evidence that came out of that, I mean, you torture someone, they'll tell you whatever you want to hear. You know, it's true. Yeah. It's an extremely and uniquely ineffective way of getting information out of someone, and um, and so you know, it's it was, and we I think you know we had, we had this kind of all this goodwill, and it was very badly tarnished by the, the execution of you know this mission. So, so it was examining those kind of through an, a, a lens of ethics. I've always been fascinated by that, the, the idea of moral absolutism, moral relativism what we would call kind of deontologism versus consequentialism, which is, you know, when you really reduce it down, does the end justify the means? You know, what, what are we, are we focusing on the moral value of an action in and of itself, or are we focused on the moral value of an action based on its consequences? Um, and so, you know, you can really kind of tie stuff up in philosophical knots thinking about it. And, um, and so, uh, and there's no answer, you know, there's no right answer, wrong answer. I mean, it depends on kind of, you know, where you cut the cloth, but, so, so thematically, the Justice of Kings examines those, and the whole Empire of the Wolf trilogy examines those. You know, well, we have a set of rules, and the deontologist would say, well, the rules are what's important, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and someone will say, well, the rules, and a consequentialist would say, well, we don't, if, but if the rules produce bad outcomes, then we can philosophically we can ignore them, um, and so it's this kind of, you know, Helena is she's young, she's naive, and von Volt's kind of so sure, but then von Volt's mm -hmm. moral code starts to slip or it certainly appears to yeah. and they're, they're kind of really shocked Selena and so we're kind of getting into those those themes so thematically I, I think I've been interested in that side of things and humans and systems colliding and and you know what do you do in these circumstances um you know and it comes down to your appetite for <laughs> doing bad things ultimately but um <laughs> so so thematically yes absolutely but you know obviously in a, in a literal sense not, not at all because you know justice of kings is, is fantasy <laughs> yeah um so we have time for one or two more quick ones um so in an interview earlier in the summer uh fonda lee and actually in her talk yesterday sonia dean um described your book as one of their favorite books uh that came out in <laughs> the last year or this year so far so nice. you know <laughs> what's uh what's your favorite book that's come out in the last year i saw the fond de Lee thing actually i was in the i was in the same video myself um I, yeah, that was a re that really came out of left field and i was very um i was very flattered because obviously she's a tremendous writer and, and i respect her greatly um i love jade city and jade war i've not read jade legacy yet but i'm going to um sonia dean's um book eat is, is going out of gangbusters mm. um I, that's on my uh, to be read pile as well that looks phenomenally good um my favorite book over this year was uh, between two fires by chris buhlman um it was a book i bought a little while ago and i think he's best known for black tongue thief which i haven't read in fact mm. between two fires is the only book of his i have read but it was just this just absolutely extraordinary novel um sort of cosmic horror set in a kind of medieval france um you know, it's set in the in the plague in the sort of middle of the 14th century um and it's and, and the war in heaven is happening at the same time so yeah, in, a, in a literal sense there's angels and demons battling out um and this is kind of like traveling across this sort of blasted french landscape so i highly highly recommend that book it was just not only was it the best book i've read this year but it's probably one of the best books i've ever read actually um it was brilliant wow <laughs> yeah 
Um, and speaking of books to be read, uh, so we have our readathon uh, next month. And so we've asked authors to provide a prompt for people to help choose their final book. And you have a prompt yes. for us. I do have a prompt for you. My prompt is uh, a book that has a wolf theme or a physical, it can be a physical wolf in it, or it can be a wolf in the title, or, or it can be some kind of lupine theme, or it can be a book by Gene Wolfe. Um, so that's my, that's my prompt, a lupine prompt. I'm sure people will have absolutely no issues filling that one in. <laughs> <laughs> so that's more or less our time. So thanks again, uh, Richard. Um, anyone that wants to know more about Richard or his works, you can visit his website, stonetemplelibrary.com. And his book, um, Justice of Kings, is available Waterstones, Broken Binding, Barnes & Noble, any, any bookstore near you. So thanks everyone for coming. And um, this is the first talk of the second day of the Fantasy Fellowship Call. Um, we will have a series of more talks and workshops running for the rest of the day. And all of yesterday's talks will soon be available to rewatch. If you want to know more, please visit our website, uh, fantasyfellowship.co.uk, or check us out on Twitter or um, Instagram. Thanks again, Richard. Thanks again, Thank everyone, for watching. Thank you very much. And Thank you. Cheers. Thanks. Great. Thank you. <laughs>